What's up you guys? If you're seeing this on YouTube, you guys are catching the live replay. I'm currently live on TikTok. So let's see what questions the people have for us today. If you guys are interested, I do natal chart readings. I also do progress natal chart readings. You guys can find all that information on my website. It's going to be in the description box below. Oh my gosh, then Miles Marion, thank you. So this is for I, you said, your ex is a Leo and you're a Capricorn. Thoughts on compatibility. Honestly, you guys, for compatibility, you guys want to look at the entire natal chart. There's so many things to look at. You want to see what's going on in this industry, what's going on with the rest of the placement. So it's hard to say in terms of just Leo and Capricorn. The energy could be good. I mean, the Capricorn energy could be very like balancing for the Leo energy. You know, Leo's fiery, right? And then Capricorn could give you that stability that you're looking for. Both of you guys could be really into like the Regal vibes, the wealth, these types of things. Advice for Pisces Midheavens. Yes. Okay. So if you have a Pisces Midheaven or tune in the 10th house, okay, for you guys, it's going to be very, very challenging when it comes to your career because you guys are going to want to do everything. So my advice is find that one thing that you guys love, whatever that is, whether that's music, whether that's acting, whether that is theater, whether that is... Honestly, anything creative, psychic, metaphysical, and stick to that thing. Obviously, it's going to depend on the rest of your natal chart. But the thing is, Pisces Midheaven wants to do everything. And the thing is, when you're trying to do everything, you're not going to get too much done. So that's my advice. And you won't see this area clearly. And also for people who have Pisces Midheaven, a lot of the time, like your career or what you think you want to do for your career gets placed upon you by like your surroundings. So what I would suggest is look at your fourth house as well, which is usually Virgo, and see what kind of upbringing you may have had because maybe the parents were very like particular about what they wanted for you in terms of your career. So that could be like blurring the lines. Having a Pisces Midheaven, it's kind of like this area is blurred for you is really what that is. Thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Welcome to all people joining. If you guys have questions about your natal charts, astrology, metaphysics, feel free to comment below. But yeah, that's the struggle with Pisces Midheaven overall or Neptune in the 10th house because it's like, you just don't see this area clearly. You dream about it a lot. Like you notice yourself escaping through it. Like, oh my gosh, I can see myself doing this thing. And this is the type of career I want to have. But acting on it is going to be really hard. Obviously, it depends on the rest of your natal chart. Let's say you have a bunch of Aries energy or even first house energy. Maybe it's going to be a different story for you. But overall, it's not clear. So that's the whole struggle with the Pisces Midheaven. So pick one thing that you really, really feel like is your calling and stick to that thing. Don't try to do everything. And another thing that I would say is, oh my gosh, thanks so much for the... That looks like French fries, but I don't know. <laughs> thank you for that. Oh, it says perfume. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's the overall vibe, okay, with the Pisces Midheaven. You kind of have to pair the action along with your visualization. Oh my gosh, hey, Irina, how are you? What's up? You said it's not clear at all. I know, it's a struggle. It's a struggle when you have Pisces Midheaven. It just is because it's like you want to do everything, you know? You have to look at Pisces of the water. Hey, what's going on? What's up? What's the 411? That's the thing. So that's the struggle, okay, with Pisces Midheaven, because it's like you want to do everything and then you end up getting nothing done and you think about it and you dream about it. So my suggestion is to pair the action along with your dreams. Oh my gosh, thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Let me know if you guys have questions about your natal charts, astrology, metaphysics, the psychic world, dreams, these types of things. Hey then, Miles Marion, how are you doing? You said any advice to a Mercury and Mars at the 10th house? Yes, so you have Mercury and Mars in the 10th house. Mars in the 10th house is a nice placement. I've seen a lot of reality TV. People have Mercury in the 10th house, actually. So basically, it's like it deals with your public image, right? So you might be working in the public. A lot of the time, like I've also noticed for 10th house people, obviously it depends on the rest of their natal charts. What can take place is you can work with the public in one way, shape, or form, but you can also become very well known in a niche. So let's say you said they're in Libra. So let's say, for example, you become like an interior designer. Having that in the 10th house, you're now gonna maybe become well-known in that particular niche, okay? So that's something that takes place with that 10th house energy when you have, I would say, more than one placement in there. Mars in the 10th house is nice. You're gonna work hard. It's conjuncting your midheaven. Can you tell me if your midheaven is in Libra as well? How would you use your 8th house Taurus Mars better? Oh my gosh, thank you. I'm so glad that you discovered me on YouTube. Yes, if you guys are new here, definitely check out my YouTube channel. It's called Barbara Talks. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely check it out. I have so many playlists on there and so many different things, mainly astrology that I talk about. But yes, I'm currently doing my Mars series. So that is slowly, slowly coming out starting from today. So back to the eighth house Taurus Mars. Okay, 
So having Taurus Mars is a little bit of a struggle because it's like you come out of the fiery Aries energy, right? It's like you come out of fiery Aries, you go into Taurus, everything kind of slows down a little bit, okay? It's good for like earthly things, you know, it's going to be very good for like earthly things in terms of like, you know, kind of creating a goal and going after that goal. But what I will say for Taurus Mars is like they struggle sometimes with blinders on, okay? That is a struggle for Taurus Mars. So it's like sometimes there could be a different way of doing something, maybe easier, maybe faster, but Taurus is like, no, I have my goals, I have my plans, it's fixed, right? So it's like, it's hard to get them to budge. It's hard to get them to like maybe work with like mentors, for example, right? Like something that could make it easier for you guys. So that's just something to know and keep in mind and maybe, you know, learn to be a little bit more flexible in that area. The next thing what I will say for Taurus Mars is the struggle with Taurus Mars also is the fact that it's slow moving in the sense where it's like it could be a struggle to start something. So, you know, sometimes Taurus needs that push, right? Sometimes it can go into like lethargic energy a little bit, kind of like Kappa energy. I don't know. I always see Taurus as like the bull with like four feet on the ground. So it's like slowly they're getting there, right? But sometimes to get the bull to move, you kind of have to, you know, give it a little bit of that push to keep to get going, right? So that's Taurus Mars. So again, knowing this about yourself and maybe you have goals and dreams and these types of things, you know, thinking about what can motivate me, how can I get motivated? But now you have it in the eighth house. I like that, okay? Because you're gonna be very into manifestation, energy, energy work, and kind of using all these things to manifest, right? Anything to do with energy, understanding that money is energy. How can you create that, right? So you're gonna kind of, you know, be in that frame of mind. Let's see what else you guys think in here. No, I don't do yes or no questions, like psychic questions. No, just astrology questions, questions about your natal charts. If you guys want to know something about the metaphysical world, why does this manifest? How does that manifest? Like overall, um, anything to do with mysticism, those types of questions I answer, but predictive psychic questions, I don't answer. Oh my gosh, thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Let me know what you guys want to know about your natal charts and about astrology in general. Can I interpret your Chiron Capricorn in the sixth house? Yes, absolutely. So Chiron is the area that you guys heal through, okay, in this lifetime. It's the wounded healer. So when you have Chiron in Capricorn and it's in the sixth house, for you, let's say getting money, getting gains, you know, becoming wealthy, like whatever wealth means to you is a healing experience for you on a soul level, okay? Now the sixth house deals with health, healing, and being of service. So maybe when you're helping people, it's a very healing experience for you, like on a soul level, okay? Maybe when you're working with animals, it's a very healing experience for you. I'll be curious to look at the rest of your natal chart. I don't know why I'm seeing like veterinarian or like animals or something of that sort. Maybe you're interested or maybe you just have pets or something of that sort. But yeah, maybe having a pet could be very healing for you because the sixth house can deal with pets as well. So that's really what that is. I am a Scorpio moon. Oh my gosh, how did you know? How did you guess? Yes, 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 I am a Scorpio moon. Good guess, good guess, good guess. Let me know what else you guys wanna know about your natal charts. Thank you guys so much for the likes and for the follows as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're new here, make sure you guys check out my YouTube channel. It's called Barbara Talks. You said, will you have a good relationship with son in their first house? Will you have a good relationship with your son in their 12th house? Oh, interesting. Your son is in their 12th house. Very interesting. Maybe you might not feel seen by this person. That could be something that takes place. What are your signs if your birthday is October 26th? Let me think. You can go on any birth chart calculator online, astroseek, astro.com, um, cafe astrology, like all of them, and type in your birth information and select your birth chart, and then it's going to give you all the information. You also need your time of birth as well, okay? But you're probably a Scorpio if your birthday is October 26th. Cancer and Capricorn, Scorpio sun. There's so much more going on though. Cancer and Capricorn rising, Cancer rising and Capricorn rising compatibility. What's interesting about this dynamic is I've noticed that it does tend to manifest the other because it's like both of you are each other's descendant sign. So the descendant sign is the seventh house, right? So for Cancer Rising, the descendant is Capricorn, right? So your seventh house is occupied by Capricorn. What does this mean? You want serious relationships, okay? You might be into people who are older than you. You might be into people who are more mature than you. If it's not an age thing, it's just someone who's more mature, someone who is maybe more about actual like relationships and settling down and these types of things. Someone who is about maybe like working hard and these types of things. So that's Cancer Rising, okay? Capricorn rising, descendant is going to be in Cancer. So they're going to attract Cancerian types of people, nurturing people, right? People who are all about creating a home. A lot of traditional energy might take place 
in this dynamic so you guys attract each other so yes it is compatible it's opposing right but the thing is like both of these energies are seeking stability in different ways cancer energy is seeking is seeking stability through the home okay that's cancer energy creating a home you know like having a nice home, having a family, that's Cancer Energy Capricorn is seeking stability through money and wealth. So they're both seeking stability just in different ways. Let's see what else you guys seeing in here. Piercing voice and eyes, Scorpio moon. Oh my gosh, no way, I never heard the voice thing. Very, very interesting. But yes, yes, the eyes I have heard, Scorpio moon, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, RNS says, can I interpret your North Node Gemini in the 11th house? Yes, okay. So you guys, to understand your North node, you want to look at the South node, okay? Because the South node, oh my gosh, thanks so much for the likes, guys. Thank you for the likes. So the South node for you is gonna be in Sagittarius and it's gonna be in the fifth house. So South node is gonna tell you your past life, okay? So that's where you're coming from. So sometimes what happens with people is like the South node might be something that you're falling toward in this lifetime in terms of like, maybe wanting to do that or being drawn to it because it's comfortable and it's familiar, but you don't want to focus on the South node. You want to actually focus on the North node, which might be more uncomfortable for you because it's different, right? It's opposing. So South node for you, your past life could have been very Sagittarius like, so you could have been about the higher mind. You could have been about like learning, you know, philosophies, religions, and it could have been very creative. Psychically, what I'm seeing actually because of the fifth house, maybe you were doing presentations on a stage or maybe you were, you were even like a guru or something on that sort in a past life, okay? where maybe you guys, where maybe you moved around or you did something of this sort with that fifth house energy. But now that could have manifested different ways. Maybe it was like a motivational speaker selling something, speaking, right? It's the speaking access. So in this lifetime, you come through. So the South Node, right, and Sag is like kind of like a large message, right? That you're communicating maybe to a large group of people with Gemini it could be a little bit more simplified now in this lifetime. So you're communicating something is the written or the spoken word. So your life purpose deals with communication. It deals with explaining things, teaching something, right? It's that teaching access. The 11th house though, in this lifetime is going to be your ideas. It's going to be your futuristic way of thinking. Okay. You might be very different in terms of the way you perceive the world. Okay. You might be very innovative. You might be into tech. You might be into AI and these types of things. Okay. So that's kind of where you're heading in this lifetime. So you can kind of look at it as your North star. Hey, welcome to everyone joining. If you guys have questions about your natal charts or astrology, feel free to comment below and make sure you guys check out my YouTube channel. It's called Barbara Talks. So Kate said, could you please interpret your sun and Mercury and Aquarius in the eighth house? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So you have your sun and you have your Mercury in Aquarius. Mercury in Aquarius is an interesting one because it's like this energy is going to be very, very intelligent because all of the air signs deal with intelligence in one way, shape or form. You have it in the eighth house. I love Mercury in the eighth. These people are usually really, really intelligent. They're always playing chess. Okay. They're always strategic. So for you, you're probably here to, you're probably here to explain some sort of new idea, right? It's all about the mind. It's all about kind of the vision for the future. Because the thing is, Aquarius energy gathers people together for some sort of larger purpose. And another thing that I've been thinking about recently, actually, and this is going to be a little bit, you know, in, a little bit inception vibes, I guess you can say. So it's like, if you look at all of the signs, right? Aquarius, if you look at the 12th house of Aquarius, what's preceding Aquarius, is going to be in Capricorn, right? So within Aquarius energy, in a way you can kind of look at it as, you know, the internal unconscious energy of an Aquarius is the Capricorn energy, right? You can do this for all the signs and then you can kind of do that for all the placements to see how it's also operating, okay? So hope you guys are following because it's inception, okay? We're kind of going within, within, okay? So within Mercury and Aquarius, right? So within Aquarius energy, there's a Capricorn energy where it's like, it still wants to work hard. It used to be ruled by Saturn, right? And it's like, it's still about time, right? And it's all about, you know, the efficiency of time, but for a larger cause now, right? Now you're expanding it outward. You're kind of gathering all these people together for some sort of higher mind, higher idea, and these types of things, okay? So having those two eight house placements is gonna make you very, very psychic, very intuitive. You're, you might even be a medium with that eight house energy. You could have even maybe been surrounded by like loss or death in the earlier part of your life. If it's not literal, it could just be like, you know, maybe moving a lot, right? Like loss in this sense, these types of things, or maybe you going through a lot of changes and you going through a lot of transformations. So that's the thing, okay, with that eighth house energy. Eighth house is sometimes hidden, so you might have to work a little harder to pull that energy out, right? So you might think about it more in terms of like, I wanna share these ideas and I wanna connect the collective in this way. And like, this is the way that I see the future. You might be very like futuristic in terms of like, you could be into astrology, technology, you could be into anything that's innovative, okay? It could even be fashion. Sometimes I've seen 
the Aquarius energy in the fashion industry as well, because it's like they're futuristic in terms of trendsetting. So you yourself are going to be a trendsetter. Aquarius in astrology, they used to say is like 10 to 15 years ahead of their time. I think now that because the frequency of the planet is higher, it's maybe sooner. So maybe it's like five years ahead of your time or whatever. Maybe it's even two months, but you're ahead of the curve. Let's see what else you guys think in here. Oh my gosh, you're also a Scorpio moon. You said you hardly open up even to your closest friends. Very, very interesting. I have moon in the first house though. So for me, it's like, it's like all out there. Let's see what else you guys saying in here. Without knowing the rest of your chart, you hit it. Yay, I'm so glad that I did. What I will say for Scorpio moon energy though, it's like a few things, okay? When Scorpio energy overall becomes aware of how energy works, that's like, it's not that they're secretive. They can just become very like, protective over let's say an idea right like let's say they're trying to birth an idea or a new creation or you're trying to like get a job like whatever it is right something that's kind of like still formulating and it's not anchored yet that's when scorpio energy is not going to talk about it oh my gosh you're also a scorpio moon welcome 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 to the scorpio moon gang let me know what you guys have your fourth house in your midheaven is in virgo at the 10th house so mercury Mars in Libra 10th house and then your midheaven is in Virgo. Okay, very, very nice. I think I remember from before. Very private, but fifth house with Cancer rising is a weird mix. Yeah, I have a lot of air energy in my chart too. So yeah, there's that going on. But I also have a lot of Scorpio energy in my chart too. I have a Scorpio stellium and I have a Libra stellium happening at the same time. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I literally work so hard. Every time you guys compliment my eyeliner, I'm like, yes. The Virgo in me, I got 12th house Virgo. Okay, the Virgo in me is like, yes. Like I literally was perfecting this for so long to like get it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Let's see what else you guys saying in here. Aries, Sun, Moon, Venus, and Mercury. What does it mean? You have lots of fire. Yeah, that's a lot of fire. So Aries, Sun, Moon, Venus, and Mercury. Oh my gosh, that is a lot of Aries energy. Okay, here's the thing with Aries, you guys. Yes, yeah, sometimes they can be argumentative. One of your themes in your life is going to be conflict management, conflict resolution, learning to control your emotions. Yes, you might be impulsive in the earlier part of your life. But you know what's interesting with Aries energy? I recently said this on one of my lives. It's like a lot of like their like reactivity is rooted in like wanting justice because they bounce off of Libra energy, you know? So it's like Aries, right? Basically, you know, because they bounce off of Libra, that's their opposition. When they feel like something's not fair or like they're not being heard in the way that they want to be heard, especially because you have it in the Mercury, they're going to say it right away. So that's kind of what you're balancing. Sometimes you go through that pendulum swing, right? Where they go from like intense, like, you know, saying everything right away and, you know, saying things. The thing is though, like Aries energy is kind of here to master, like, you know, when to say what, and relationships in a way, right? Because it's like sometimes that impulsivity, right? In terms of what they're saying, how they say it, you know, sometimes they can be abrupt in the way they speak things. Sometimes those things can cost them their relationships and that's what they're balancing within, right? Every time you guys have a sign in your natal chart, you guys want to look at the oppositional energy to see what it is that you're balancing. So Aries is learning about, yes, they're independent, but they're learning about compromise also in this lifetime, which is their opposition of Libra, okay? So you might attract a lot of Libra people into your life and they might bother you in the sense where it's like, you know, Libras can be like very passive. Libras can be very much like, yes, you know, sometimes Libras might struggle with their own identity. So you're teaching them how to have their own identity and then they're teaching you how to like compromise and these types of things. Let's see. Oh my gosh, you said that you're Pisces rising also. Love it. Yes, that was another thing that I wanted to say actually. Okay, so what I was saying earlier, something that I've been thinking about recently, and I don't know if this is a thing. This is just something that I was thinking about within every sign, right? So if you look at that particular sign and you look at the sign as the first house, then the preceding house of that sign, okay? This is gonna be like inception, right? We're kind of going in and then in again. So within that sign, you have the 12th house, which is going to be the preceding sign. So within Aries energy, right? There is Pisces in the 12th house. So unconsciously within Aries, there's a dreamer, right? That's the thing with Aries. There's a dreamer. There's this like, there's this naivete connected to them because of the Aries energy, but it's like they have these dreams, right? Because within Aries, there is Pisces, right? So you can kind of look at it like that too. Let's see what else are you guys saying in here? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Marlo. Oh my gosh, so kind of you. What else are you guys saying in here? You said you have Scorpio in your 12th house. Yeah, so what I'm saying is like, okay, in your chart, in your chart, yes, you have all of the houses, right? For everything. But 
what you guys can also look at is let's say in in your mars right let's say in mars you have it in Aries, right? So to understand your Mars placement even more, you can look at within that Aries energy, this is why it's inception, within that Aries energy, you have Pisces, because that would be the 12th house of that, okay? It's a little bit confusing. I'm sure you guys are gonna catch my drift though. It'll settle at another time. So then like, let's say you have Mars in Aries, and within that there's Pisces, right? So within every Aries energy, there's Pisces within it, because that's like the 12th house unconscious energy, right? So within Aries, there's this dreamer, right? They dream, you know, of like these like huge things, you know, they're hopeful in this way, you know? And if you look at it, even in the tarot, right? That full card where you're jumping in, you know, the hero's journey, the beginning, that's Aries, you're jumping off the cliff. So sometimes Aries, like for the individual who had a bunch of Aries energy in their natal charts, you're gonna be very much like a go-getter. You're gonna be good at starting things, but you're going to struggle to actually continue doing them. That's what then Taurus is later on teaching you. But that's the overall vibe of Aries, you know? They're very good at initiating, but the thing is they're very much like short-term gratification. So if they don't get like the results that they're seeking, and you know, whatever it is that they're trying to achieve right away, they might drop that project. So that's the struggle with Aries, you know? So eventually you progress, right? We all progress, we all grow and we all evolve. So you can look at your secondary progressions. So eventually Aries is gonna go into Taurus, okay? And eventually, probably toward the end of like that Aries fiery energy, you'll go into building, right? Now you're building something. Kay says Aries midheaven, but Leo Mars in the second. What does this mean? How do you work with that? Yes, absolutely, oh my gosh, so much fire. And you said you have the Scorpio moon, right? So Aries Midheaven, okay, Aries Midheaven is really interesting because it's like, okay, when you look at the Midheaven, we want to look at the fourth house, okay? So your Midheaven is in Aries, so your fourth house is in Libra. So what's interesting about the Aries Midheaven is like, they tend to come from an upbringing of like, you know, where there could have maybe been a lot of conflict or something of this sort, or maybe like there was a lot of like, you know, a lot of like, what's the word, like people pleasing within the home or something of that sort. Because the thing is, when you have the Aries in heaven, your fourth house is in Libra. So it's like, you know, internally, right? You have this Libra energy within because your fourth house can give you the undertone of what your moon is also, right? So undertone energy, you have a Libra moon. So you want everyone to like you and you might be a people pleaser yourself, right? Because there was something in the home that was constantly being balanced and maybe you were balancing it or at least maybe you felt like you were balancing it. But it's like now you go into the real wor world where it's like you have your 10th house in Aries and you want to be a leader and you want to be number one and you want to be an entrepreneur. So something that this energy has to basically integrate within themselves is the people pleasing aspect of things. You know, sometimes the Aries midheaven and then Libra fourth house I see access struggles with like expressing their opinions, okay? Struggles with like, again, wanting everybody to like them and that's not realistic in this world, right? Not everybody's gonna like you. Different people are gonna vibe with you at different times. And it's like, I always bring it back to the self, right? If we're all realistic with ourselves, we also don't like everybody ourselves either, right? We also don't vibe with everybody like either, you know what I mean? So that's the thing. So a lot of the time, you know, when you have the access going on within the home, right? There could have been a lot of like something taking place where it's like you constantly wanted there to be balance, you wanted there to be like fairness, but it's like now it affects you when you go out there into the world and you want to lead basically, right? The 10th house for you is in Aries here to start something new, maybe in terms of your like, you know, career cycle, maybe there's that, maybe you're gonna be the first one in the family to do something different from the rest of the family when it comes to career and your public image. But regardless, like you have to do something where you're the best, right? This could also be something where maybe you're interested in something of athletics or something of that sort, because you have a lot of fire energy and then you also have the Scorpio moon. So that could be something that you're interested in as well, but something where like you're at the top. And the thing is like, Aries midheaven can't really work in like a partnership type of thing like in terms of their jobs like they have to be the best right they have to be number one so there's like best employee or the manager or the team lead or just like you start your own business like that's kind of like the vibe hey luna how are you doing so leo mars for you and you have it in the second house the second house is nice okay it's grounding the leo mars energy needs to be seen okay once again okay you need to be seen something you might have to integrate within yourself could be the vulnerability aspect of things with the scorpio moon Sometimes Scorpio moon, like, might feel like they're exposing themselves too much, you know? There could be that energy where it's like they don't want to show vulnerability to the world, but it's like Leo Mars wants to be seen, right? So it's like the Scorpio moon could spend more time, like, dreaming about this, for example, right? And, like, being like, I, you know, this is what I want to do. But it's like what I can say for Scorpio moon energy is, like, Scorpio moon is like hyper aware, right? Of everything. And most people aren't like that. You know what I mean? So whatever you notice, most people wouldn't notice. So I don't know if that would help in that situation. Let's see what else you guys say in here. 
But yeah, you definitely need to be seen. I just put out a Leo Mars video today. So it's on my YouTube channel, it's called Barbara Talks. There's just so much to say. You need to be seen creatively. You need to be out there, right? In the world, like seen physically, right? You need to literally be seen. That is the Leo Mars, either being funny or theatrical or acting. Sometimes entrepreneurship I've noticed with Leo Mars as well. So that's the overall vibe, okay? Venus Sagittarius, these are other ways that you can bring through abundance as well. So Venus Sag, it's interesting. Venus Sag sometimes is known to be the bachelor or the bachelorette of the Zodiac. But it's like what they're seeking is freedom, you know? So they need a relationship that allows them to be free is basically what that is. Let's see. Oh, you're welcome. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that that res resonated. Okay, Astrology with Zoe says, do you know anything about North Nose squaring your midheaven? Interesting, let me know what you have in each of them. What house is it in, your North Node, and what sign is in there as well. But it's definitely gonna create friction and tension between your public image and your purpose in this lifetime. Venus in Capricorn in the sixth house. Venus in Capricorn, Venus in Capricorn, honestly, anytime I see people with Capricorn energy anywhere, hardworking, and also from a young age, Sometimes what might happen is like, sometimes you start working from like a very young age, Venus and Capricorn, but Capricorn overall, overall, you're always going to be seeking wealth. Okay. That's going to be something like luxury, elevating the financial status. And you're going to be seeking that when it comes to your relationships and your friendships also, because that's what Venus can deal with is your friendships. It's your relationships. It's your business partnerships. So Venus and Capricorn doesn't like to waste time. Okay. They look for serious relationships, long-term relationships, more mature partners, Sometimes what I've noticed with Venus and Capricorn, one of two things can happen. Sometimes when they're young, they get into a relationship where like that them and that other person that they're dating, they're building together. Okay, that's one way that it can manifest. Another way that this energy can manifest is you build when you're young and then you seek for someone who is at the same level as you. So that's another thing that can happen for this energy. But Venus and Capricorn is like, what I like about Capricorn energy, they're like the, I guess, most mature earth sign, you know? And what I like about them is like, they understand the value of like connections. And again, every relationship for them, they kind of feel like they're investing into it. So it's like, if you have some kind of goals, Venus and Capricorn is again, seeking the mentors, right? Or the people you're going to learn from, or again, people who are going to help you get to some sort of status that you're seeking. Venus in the sixth house, you might be critical when it comes to your partners. Okay, so that could be a little bit of a struggle. Or you might attract critical people into your life. You might attract like critical friends. That could be something that takes place for Venus in the sixth house. But overall, like the sixth house deals with health, healing, and being of service. So what could happen is like maybe you yourself can kind of just like overgive when it comes to your friendships and your relationships. So just something to watch out for. Welcome to all the people joining. <laughs> you said a useful partner. Yeah. So Capricorn energy. Okay, this is what you guys need to understand about Capricorn energy. For them, because they're ruled by Saturn, everything is revolving time, okay? So they don't want their time to be wasted and they always want their time to be efficient, right? So for Capricorn energy, like they're not gonna engage in anything unless it has some sort of efficiency energy behind it, right? So whether that is for their work, for their career, whether that is their partner that they're like wanting to build with, like they're always having some sort of end goal in mind, right? And a lot of the time what happens with Capricorn energy is when they're younger, they might feel like their time gets wasted. So Capricorn is like mastering time because it's ruled by Saturn. And Saturn is usually over an extended period of time. So a lot of the time Capricorn people start to like work hard. It's almost like they know from a higher self level that again, you know, things take time on this earth plane, unfortunately, that we're living on. I think it's gonna be fast, especially when it comes to money and success. Capricorn's aware of that. So they're gonna slowly start building their way higher and higher and higher. So when they're younger, they usually tend to surround themselves by like wealthier people, you know, people who are in these maybe positions that they already wanna be in. You know, those like sayings where people are like, you know, the five people that you surround yourself with, like you become like them, like that's Capricorn's motto, right? So every like dynamic, every situation, everything that they're doing, whether it's work, whether it's career, it's for some sort of goal in mind that they have some sort of end goal. Let's see what else are you guys saying in here. North Node in Cancer, 12th house, and it's squaring your Aries. North Node in Cancer in the 12th house, and it's squaring your Aries in Midheaven in the ninth house, yeah. North node squaring your midheaven. There could be friction when it comes to like your career versus your like overall life purpose. You know, you might kind of like feel like you're being pulled in one direction and then like being pulled in another direction. Cause the thing is like, I don't know, you know, depends like where you kind of look at it, like from what perspective, because in the West, people always kind of want to capitalize on everything that they do. But recently in one of my lives, I was saying how like, 
you know, you can live your purpose without it being your career. You know what I mean? And it's interesting because it's something to really, really think about. So that's kind of what that vibe is, right? Where it's like the overall purpose, right? Is the North Node Cancer 12th house. The Midheaven public image could be something different than that. You know, it doesn't have to be the same. What does it mean? Welcome to all the people joining. If you guys have questions about your natal charts, astrology, or metaphysics, feel free to comment below. What does it mean when you have Sun, Jupiter, Mercury, Saturn, and North Node in your partner's seventh house? You have Sun, Jupiter, Mercury, Saturn, and North Node in your partner's seventh house. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of placements in the seventh house. Well, one thing that I want to tell you to pay attention to is definitely don't become codependent on this person because seventh house energy can become very like enmeshed and just like want to be with that person all the time. And then like maybe fear being alone, like there could be an energy of that taking place. Also, this energy could be good for business, actually, because the seventh house can be a good business person as well. I don't know if that's something that you guys are interested in starting together. You said interesting. Your north node transit will conjunct your midheaven soon. Oh, my gosh, that's so interesting. Maybe you're going to be thrown on like a different path or something of that sort, like something that's more, not a different path, path, but something that's more in alignment with your actual overall life purpose. Because you said you have your North Node in Cancer in the 12th house. It feels like your life purpose is very spiritual. You said hopefully you want change. Yeah, honestly, like for certain like natal charts, when I look at them, sometimes to me, it feels like the rest of the collective is catching up with oh my gosh thank you that is so very nice of you so sometimes it feels like the rest of the collective is catching up with that person like let's say like you're a piscean person or like a watery person or if you're like an aquarius person so what i mean by this is like certain things have to take place in the collective for a lot of these people's purposes to be activated like that's sometimes how i see it so it's nice because everything's happening faster i hope that makes sense Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you guys have any questions about your natal charts or astrology, feel free to comment below. Oh my gosh, there you go. Also, Ball's traveling soon. Oh my gosh, I love that. Yes, that would be definitely something that's in alignment with your purpose because the Cancer energy, Cancer energy usually wants to be like in a home, you know, so maybe having this podcast out of a place that feels like home or making it very homey, that could be something that like really, really like resonates. You know what I mean? And it's nice because then it like, kind of activates that midheaven too for you where it's like the midheaven is starting something right starting something new so honestly my suggestion for everyone is to just like go for it like honestly start things do things try them out see if you like them you know because sometimes the idea you have of something is like completely different than like actually doing it i've done so many different things in my life oh my gosh natty says hi you have a question yes what's your question natty and welcome you said cancer sun sagittarius moon Taurus rising and you're not sure what any of that means or the qualities. Okay, I'll tell you. So your Cancer Sun, honestly, with the Sun energy in a natal chart, you can kind of look at it for different things. Like the Sun, it's interesting that like, you know, when people read about horoscopes or when people first learn about like their signs, everyone's focused on the Sun sign, right? They're going to be like, oh my gosh, like I'm a Cancer and this person is, you know, a Sagittarius or whatever, right? But there's so much more to it. So the Sun, they say, is who we think we are, right? They say that we think that we're this energy. That's the Sun energy. Sometimes it could be your impression to people. Sometimes it can be the ego. Sometimes it can tell you about the father. Sometimes cancer sons might have like a father that was maybe more lethargic or lazy. Um, maybe there was alcoholism. I've noticed sometimes for cancer sons, they might struggle with that. Or maybe he was more feminine or just nurturing overall. Like maybe he operated more out of his feminine energy. But again, for that, like that's something I have to look at the whole chart to see what's going on with them. So that's cancer sun, right? So still at the end of the day within you, right? Within your masculine energy, because the sun, yes, it represents the father, but then in turn, it's going to represent the internal masculine energy. You might be more feminine energy leaning where it's like, you might be more sentimental. You might be more nostalgic. You might be like very, maybe very attached to people and places and memories and things, you know what I mean? Family is going to be very important. We're just like creating family vibes with people. That's kind of like Cancer Sun energy. So it's a very nurturing vibe. Sagittarius Moon. Sagittarius Moon. Okay, here's the thing. I love Sagittarius Moon because it's like they can be very scattered, especially in the earlier part of their life. Thanks so much for the likes, you guys. In their earlier part of their life, they can be very they can be very scattered. Where it's like I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to do this, like wanting to do everything, and they're learning, right? And it's like this energy kind of goes off on an adventure and they learn about something, right? Because you're basically developing a new philosophy. A lot of the time, Sagittarius Moon people, like they create their own philosophy on life based on their experiences. They go off and they learn something. Now, alternatively, it can deal with higher education as well. So you could be interested in maybe pursuing like higher education and learning and these types of things. But usually 
with, with Sagittarius energy, I've noticed they tend to be more inclined to learn through experience and other people and like, you know, doing all these, all these things at once, going on adventures, having fun. Now what's interesting with Sagittarius moon is they tend to be known to be the bachelor or the bachelorette of the Zodiac. Thank you so much for the rose. So the thing is because they tend to be known like this, it doesn't mean that you're always going to be the bachelor or the bachelor of the Zodiac. Basically Sagittarius is seeking freedom on an emotional level. That's what that is when you have it in the moon sign. Okay. So wherever you guys have Sagittarius in your natal chart, you're seeking freedom for that particular area, right? So for you, it's in the moon. Okay. So for you, you are seeking freedom on an emotional level. So it's like when it comes to relationships and your friendships and your jobs and whatever it is, if it feels like it's suffocating you, if it feels like it is, you know, trying to hold you down, or if it's like too restrictive, or if it's like a job where it's like, you have to clock in at exactly nine and you go on your break exactly at whatever, 10, whatever it is, right? That's too restrictive for Sagittarius energy. They need to be free. They need to be roaming around. Around, right so I've noticed like for Sagittarius energy like sometimes like because of this fiery nature to them and like I want to do this I want to do that like let's say like some of them for example might do school later right when the energy kind of subsides and gets a lot of things out of their system travel is going to be really important to you if you can't travel then it's like people who are traveling abroad coming to you right you dealing with like maybe tourism or something of the sort. So that's Sagittarius moon okay but overall what I will say is when they find that thing that they like they're gonna be very good at it, but they can switch up like this because it's mutable energy at the end of the day. It's very good for like sales, you know, because they believe in it so much and it's fiery and it's passion. So like they can really pitch things to people and convince them. Now you have Taurus rising. Taurus rising is nice. It's a grounded energy. It'll ground everything that you got going on in there. This is the first impression you give to the world. So your first house is in Taurus, right? You might give off like a very grounded type of vibe, which is interesting, right? Because it's like, you might give that impression, but deep down inside on an emotional level, you could be seeking freedom, right? You could like material things, you could like luxury things. Like for you, for example, going on like a luxurious vacation is definitely gonna be more interesting probably than doing something that's not luxurious, right? Thanks so much for the likes, you guys. So that is the Taurus rising energy. You're gonna work hard and Taurus rising builds over time, okay? That's Taurus energy. They are building over time. So you'll notice throughout their life, as they grow, they're accumulating more wealth and more things of that sort, like wealth things. Oh my gosh, thanks so much for the likes, you guys. You guys are so awesome. Thank you for the roses. What else do you guys wanna know about, about your natal charts? Astrology, astrology in general, energies, psychic world, being a psychic, psychic life, all of these things. We could talk about it all, all the dreams, dream time. You're welcome, you're welcome. Definitely check out your entire natal chart and see what house you have it in, okay? so. What I like about astrology is like, okay, to understand, thanks so much for sharing. Okay, to understand the planet versus the sign versus the um, house, okay? So for you guys to understand this, okay? The planet is going to be what the energy is, okay? So all the planets have a specific type of energy. The sign in there is going to be how that energy is expressing itself, okay? In what way? And then the house is going to be the area of life that that energy is focused in, okay? So a lot of the time when people have stelliums or they have a certain amount of houses or they have, you know, like this amount of houses, maybe they have a stellium in certain, let's say you have a lot of fourth house energy or whatever. Sometimes people don't have stelliums. I have seen that as well, but whatever. Regardless, there might be empty houses, right? Or like planets that don't belong to a house. In that particular situation, you've already mastered that thing, right? You've mastered that area of life. So in this lifetime, you're focusing on maybe whatever the stellium is, you're clearing the karma, maybe you're finally getting to live this, maybe you didn't get to live it in a past life, so that's what's really, really cool. No, I don't do transit readings, I don't do them yet. I just do natal chart readings and I do progress natal chart readings, okay? So it is all on my website. If you guys are on TikTok, you guys can go on the link in my bio. If you guys are watching the YouTube replay, which by the way, you guys check out my YouTube channel, it's called Barbara Talks. So if you guys are on my YouTube channel, check it out. It is going to be in the description box below. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. If you guys have questions about your natal charts, astrology, metaphysics, yes, definitely check it out. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, definitely check out my YouTube channel. And then I have my Instagram. My Instagram is more so like my day to day. So I just like post like random things on my story. Sometimes I write things on there, but it's more so like what I'm doing in like my everyday. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Yes, 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 yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love the hype people. Yes, definitely. Definitely do that. Thank you, Natty. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the good vibes, you guys. Let me know if you guys have questions. Any other questions about your natal charts, astrology, 
metaphysics, the metaphysical world, the psychic world, intuitive world. How to manifest abundance with part of fortune. Yes, okay. So for everyone wanting to know how to make money in your natal charts, there's a few things you guys can look at, okay? Part of fortune is one of them. So you can look at part of fortune, you can look at your second house, you can look at your eighth house, you can look at your Jupiter, you can actually look at your Venus as well. You can look at your North Node, you can look at the overall vibe of the chart, you can see if there's a concentration of houses, you can look at the Midheaven, okay? So you can look at all those things to see how you can make money. So when you have part of fortune, and you said in the eighth house of Pisces, for you, okay, ways you can make abundance could be through Piscean-like things and eighth house-like things. So for you, for example, you could make money through astrology, for example, that's part of fortune. Anytime you're engaging in that world, you're activating that abundance for yourself. So for you, it's anything to do with Pisces energy. So what's Pisces? Pisces is spirituality, metaphysics, the metaphysical world, film, theater, art, creativity. It's vast, right? Because Pisces really does expand a lot of things. Anything to do with dreams and illusions. So for example, maybe photography, right? Maybe being a photographer, you can make abundance through doing these types of things. Anything that's creative, anything to do with like video making and editing, anything to do with like, you know, when you add like music to a video and you create like a vibe, like these types of things, that's Pisces, okay? Then you have eighth house. Eighth house, what is the eighth house? Sex, death, rebirth, joint finances, taxes, and the occult. It's on a range, right? And a lot of the time people ask themselves and they're like, well, what is all, what do all of these things have to do with each other? Power and control, okay? So with that, you can be a therapist, for example, right? Or a psychologist or a sex therapist, or again, astrology, right? The occult, occult knowledge, magic, right? All these things can activate abundance for yourself, okay? Also, it can be anything to do with maybe even being a financial advisor, working at the bank, working with money, working with other people's money, helping people maybe with loans. Like that's all eighth house, anything to do with like other people's money. And then he says your second house is in Leo. So you guys can also look at your second house to see how you guys can make money as well. I think I have a video on that on my YouTube channel. YouTube channel is called Barbara Talks. And the video I think is how to make money through your second house. It's in my miscellaneous playlist, so you can't miss it if you go under the MISC astrology playlist. But yeah, second house in Leo, you can make it through creativity again, okay? So anything that's creative, anything that you're being, any anytime that you're being seen, okay? Film, again, acting, anything to do with maybe comedy, being funny, right? Entrepreneurship can be in here as well, as long as you're being seen. What I will say though is Leo struggles with the ego, so you gotta push through that, and sometimes they struggle with rejection, so as long as you push through that, you're good to go, okay? That's Leo. So as long as you're being seen, right? I'm actually been seeing something like a hairdresser, interestingly enough. I don't know if that's something that you're interested. You're a tarot reader, spiritualist who majors in psychology. You also draw and you rap. There you go. That's something that I forgot to mention for Pisces. Music is another one for Pisces, okay? Music is something that Pisces can definitely do. You're welcome, Natty. Thank you. My big three are, sometimes I make people guess, but I'll just tell you guys. Libra Sun, my moon is in Scorpio and my rising is also in Libra. My sun is in the 12th house and my moon is in the first house. Let's see. Anything significant about a Venus return? Yes, do not get back together with your ex-lovers and don't do any plastic surgery type things for the first time. If it's like, you know, you know your doctor and you've gone to them before, whatever, like that's fine. If you can't avoid it, that's fine. But if it's the first time that you're doing something and maybe just wait until after Venus return or Venus retrograde. Um, let's see what else tattoos, like anything to do with like beauty, like just wait until Venus retrograde is done. Let's see what else you guys say in here. If two planets are sitting in the same house, one is at zero degrees and the other one is at 28 degrees in this conjunction. Can you tell me what the planets are? What house are they in? And what is the sign? Thank you. What else are you guys saying in here? You're welcome. Now I'm reading your question again, Zoe. I don't know if you meant Venus retrograde or Venus return overall. Are you talking about Venus return in your own natal chart or were you talking about Venus retrograde? Let me know. Because Venus retrograde is happening right now. We have a whole bunch of retrogrades and we have Mercury entering retro retrograde soon too. This whole year is hardcore, honestly. Honestly, ever since Pluto went back into Capricorn, it's just been like intense. Oh, you might return in your own chart. Interesting. So you might be closing out certain things when it comes to like, friendships during that time. It depends also, let me know what house you have it in. I'm curious to know what house you have it in. You could be closing out things when it comes to your friendships. Maybe it could be even like past lovers that you're closing things out or something to do with like your like patterns when it comes to relationships and these things maybe being brought to your awareness, something of that sort. He said Venus, zero and Saturn, 28 degrees 
in the ninth house of cancer you said 11 so yeah probably friendships oh my gosh confirmation let me go back up and see what your original question was two planets are sitting in the same house one is at zero degrees and the other is at 28 degrees and then you said venus is at zero degrees and saturn is at 28 degrees that's really interesting because those are critical degrees those are critical degrees. And you said it's in the ninth house of cancer. Venus in cancer is hardcore because, especially because you have it at the zero degree, which is one of the critical degrees. What I will say for Venus in cancer, there's always something going on with like the mother or like the upbringing surrounding the mother or like the dynamic with the mother that could be like maybe interfering with your love life. And same thing because it is conjuncting the Saturn. There's like karma here. It kind of feels very karmic. Something that you're clearing, like something to do with like the way you see love is through the pair like something to do with like the parents and like the upbringing that's just like psychically more so what i'm picking up on let's see leo mars at 29 degrees what does that mean okay so when you guys have the critical degrees basically it means you don't get out of that sign or like the karma of that sign until you master that sign okay so for example for venus in cancer so for cancer at zero degrees and 28 degrees the karma here is going to be the cancerian energy right so it could be codependencies that you're clearing it could be something to do with like boundaries it could be like trusting your intuition trusting yourself like these types of things okay then mars at the sorry leo mars at 29 degrees that's really really interesting you know what's interesting because that could also be a fame placement sometimes it depends obviously on the rest of your natal chart but in that situation like you would be known for something like to do with like you initiating something or putting something into action it could also be something to do with your creativity with like the leo mars in there but like the karma with the leo at the 29 degrees is like you basically have to master the leo energy right so shining and being okay with shining and not dimming your light for other people these types of things because the thing is for like mars you guys you guys can look at Mars as your personal power, okay? You can look at your solar plexus chakra. This is where your personal power comes from, okay? So for a Leo Mars, your personal power and your passion, all these types of things comes from shining. It comes from being the star. It comes from being the best, right? It comes from like, just like naturally getting that attention always. So the thing is with Leo, it's like sometimes they struggle with the ego because it's like sometimes they don't want to look stupid or they like don't want to fall or fail in front of people, right? But they want to also be seen at the same time. But sometimes you have to start, right? And sometimes, you know, you learn as you go, you know, especially like, it's interesting because, you know, it's so funny. I was just thinking about this. I was just thinking about this the other day. I was like basically saying to someone and it's like, when you get criticism of any sort, you can just kind of look at this as a way to improve and this person is helping you with your purpose, right? So Leo could struggle maybe with criticism because again, it's like, you know, it's that solar plexus energy where it's like, I already know I'm the best. So it's like, if someone maybe gives you not even criticism, just like constructive criticism or whatever they call it these days, you know, where it's like, they're trying to help you become better. It's like, it could take a while for the Leo energy to, to digest this. So that's something that can take place. And also you could be prideful. Okay. That's something that can also take place. Okay. So keep in mind, like Leo has the biggest heart, but it's like they can get burned. And sometimes like they get burned a little too soon. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Leo, like the thing is they have to get used to rejection. That's what I'm going to say. Like they have to get used to like, just like constantly putting themselves out there to the point where like they don't care anymore, you know? Let's see what else you guys think in here. Welcome to all the people joining. I'm answering astrology questions, metaphysical questions, questions about your natal charts. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below and make sure you guys check out my YouTube channel. It's called Barbara Talks. Alyssa Baby says you have 29 degrees Pluto in Scorpio fourth house. Oh my gosh, that's intense. Can you tell me if your fourth house I see is in Scorpio as well? I'm curious to know. But for you, basically, like having all that, you're going to go through a lot of transformations through the home, through the mother. I'm also curious to know if you have other Scorpio placements as well, okay? Through the feminine energy overall, because it's going through your fourth house. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of transformation in that energy and also you have it at the 29 degrees so once again the 29 degrees of scorpio in this situation is going to be like the dark side of scorpio i have so many videos on this because scorpio can go really really dark because scorpio like is very aware of what this world is so the thing is because they're aware of it like sometimes they can get like sucked into the darkness does that make sense like it, they can become very gloomy you know you said i see in scorpio my gosh and it's conjuncting your pluto there's probably been a lot of transformation when it came to your home also having your ic which is your fourth house in the sign of scorpio gives you the undertone of having a scorpio moon so you guys can look at that in your natal trust okay you have your moon sign but you also have the fourth house ic which gives you the undertone energy of that particular sign's moon okay so for example in this situation for Alyssa, so Alyssa has the ic in the sign of scorpio okay which means you have the undertone of having a scorpio moon so you could be very psychic there could have been a lot of deception when it came to the home 
And on top of that, like there could have been a lot of manipulation when it came to the home, especially like maybe like the mother, usually the fourth house does deal with the mother, but if it's not the mother, it'll be the dominant feminine role in your life. And you yourself are transforming through this area. So the thing is Pluto and Scorpio is the overall generation is a generational planet. So when you guys have Pluto in a particular sign, you incarnate with that generation to clear a particular karma with that group, okay? So Pluto and Scorpio is clearing a lot of things, actually. Pluto and Scorpio is healing. Healing, it's interesting that I said healing, but yes, they're healing. They're actually healing a lot of things within the family lines, within generational things. Um, they're kind of like a cleanup generation, I find. Like they come through and they just like have a lot of things to clear. And it's interesting because I had someone mention on one of my videos, maybe it was even last year or two years ago. I don't know. It feels like the time is just like all merged into one. But at some point someone commented and they were like saying how a lot of Pluto and Scorpio, Scorpio people don't want to have kids. And I find that interesting because it's like a lot of the time when people don't want to have kids, it's almost like energetically, they feel like they're ending the karma. So it doesn't continue going down the family line. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not. That's just how I feel into it psychically. So yeah, there's that. So that's Pluto and Scorpio. So they're clearing a lot of these things, so things to do with money and like transforming how the world views money. That's Pluto and Scorpio as well. They're overall here to like alchemize, learn about energy. I find it really interesting when you look at the generations and like certain things that they grew up with. So for example, like Pluto and Scorpio grew up with like very like wizard types of things. Okay. Some of them like had Sailor Moon when they were growing up. Others had like Harry Potter. Others had like Lord of the Rings. So a lot to do with like magic and like wizards and like witches and like all these things. Right. So that's why Scorpio's Scorpio, like the Pluto and Scorpio generation is very much into that kind of stuff. Also, it's interesting to see how it's like, I don't know, chicken or the egg. I'm not sure which one it is. So that's Pluto and Scorpio. So a lot of them are going to be into astrology, for example, right? And these types of things. And then on top of that, they're clearing like intimacy issues, fear of intimacy, fear of trust when it comes to relationships. The mother wound is a big one in this generation. So that's Pluto and Scorpio overall. Amongst many other things, I talk about it in my YouTube channel. Check it out. It is called Barbara Talks. Hey, oh my gosh. Yes. Mary, I usually go, okay, so for my lives, usually, okay, usually I don't like to set it in stone because you never know, right? I like to like go with the flow, but usually, okay, usually it's gonna be Monday evenings during maybe like between like 6.45 and 7-ish Eastern Standard Time is when I go live, okay, in between that window, I go live Mondays, okay? Um, that's when I try to go live, but usually it's in the earlier part of the week. Okay. So Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday are the days that I try to go live. Okay. Usually though, best case scenario are Mondays, but if it's not those days, then usually it could be Tuesday or Wednesday, but it's kind of like less likely as the week goes on because <laughs> I have the most amount of energy on the Monday. Right. So I try to go live on Monday evenings. <laughs> So yeah, Monday evenings in between that time window. And if you guys are on my YouTube channel, I usually post on there. Usually before that I'm before I'm going live, I'm going to be like going live in a few minutes. Yeah, it's usually like last minute, I guess. But that's usually the window. It's called Barbara Talks. Oh my gosh, it's perfect. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely check it out. It's called Barbara Talks, my YouTube channel. But that's approximately the time that I go live. Monday evenings, I try to go live and it's within like that window. Okay, between six. 45 to 7 15 like that time window okay and yeah and then i'm live for a while i'll see what else you guys saying in here no worries let's see mars and leo yes oh my gosh i have a lot of mars and leo people in my in my chat today i just posted my mars in leo video on my youtube channel okay barbara talks i just posted it today and there's other videos coming out throughout this week let's see okay brianna i hope you're still in the room you said gemini sun gemini moon gemini venus eighth house and then Libra rising, Aries, Mars. Oh my gosh, that is a lot of energy. So you're gonna be super smart, super intelligent, okay? Um, but you're gonna have a lot of interests. You're definitely gonna have a lot of interest. And then having Aries, Mars, you know, it could be a challenge for you to direct the energy. See, the thing is with Aries, Mars, like, okay, you guys can look at your Mars placement as like your personal power, okay? It's your solar plexus chakra. It's where your power comes from and your passion and like your excitement for things in life, okay? So for an Aries Mars, like you're going to be very good at starting things, but you might not be good at continuing them, especially in combination with all that Gemini energy. Gemini energy, like the thing is, as soon as something gets boring for Gemini, they drop that thing. Okay. It's like the 50 different tabs that are open in their, like on their computer, right? So Gemini energy is going to like start like whatever, like maybe they're going to be Googling Gemini, right? And then they're going to discover this actress has Gemini 
in their natal chart and they're going to be researching and they're going to be like okay you know whatever about that actress then they see a headline and that headline says this happened in that actress's life and then like throughout that whole thought process they end up on like looking up like i don't even know like something to do with like like the icebergs or whatever right so that's like the gemini thing so gemini is really interesting to me because i love to like understand like the train of thought you know what i mean like how did you go from this to this to this to this to this like that's gemini energy okay so the thing is for gemini they say like master what is it they say like jack of all trades master and none why can't you just be the jack of all trades you know because gemini can be the jack of all trades but my suggestion for gemini energy is pick that thing that you want to do master it first and then do the next thing before dropping that first thing let's say like you have an interest or you have a hobby because gemini likes to have a lot of things going on and they like to have a lot of versatility but they drop things right and it's like they can be very good at multitasking they can be very very good at multitasking because like in their mind they have all those tabs open right so it's like you might think that a gemini person is not listening to you because they're talking about this other thing but then they're going to be like hey remember that other thing we were talking about like three hours ago that's gemini energy Let's see what else you guys saying in here. But it's beautiful, beautiful energy. Like Gemini is very funny. I've seen politicians with Gemini energy in their natal chart. You might be interested in comedy, being a comedian, but something that gives you versatility, okay? Especially if you have it in the Venus, okay? When it comes to your relationships and your partnerships, you're gonna need versatility. You might date around for fun. You might not take your like romantic partner seriously. So water signs probably aren't going to mesh well with you, like, cause water signs kind of cling on. Gemini wants to be free, okay? So there's that. And then Libra rising, you're gonna be blessed with an aesthetically pleasing appearance, like symmetrical. Let's see what else you guys saying in here. You write poetry and perform that highlights your mental health. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. That's very Scorpio moon or a Scorpio fourth house, like you mentioned. I'm curious to know what your moon sign is and if you're still in the chat. Salma says, what are indicators in a chart that someone is going to marry rich or be successful? Very interesting. Okay, marrying rich is an interesting one. So for that, you have to look at the rulers, okay? So quote unquote, marrying rich, you can look at your seventh house ruler and if it's in the 10th house, then in that case, that could be a potential, okay, if it's in the 10th house. Maybe if it's in the fifth house, maybe it could be someone who has status or someone who is known. But yeah, I would say maybe if it's in the 10th house. You can also look to see what's happening in your eighth house for marriage, okay? So maybe if in your eighth house you have Taurus, for example, you could be interested, like after marriage, you could activate um, wealth and abundance for yourself. Like that's something that can take place. I have a video on that actually what happens after marriage for the eighth house in your natal chart. So that's on my YouTube channel, it's called Barbara Talks. It's under my miscellaneous playlist, okay? So that could be something that takes place. What else? Eighth house may be in Capricorn. That could also maybe be wealth, like marrying wealthy, rich. Um, Jupiter in the eighth house could be a wealthy spouse as well. That could be an indicator of a wealthy spouse. So that's that, okay? Now, looking at you being successful, there's a lot of different things. Um, the thing is, okay, when it comes to success, it's interesting because it's like, first of all, what is success and what does it mean to us? The way that I see it is like, if you have something that you like to do and you do it consistently enough and like you perfect it and you perfect your craft, like whatever that is, eventually you're going to become successful in that area, right? That's just how the earth works overall. But for success, you can look at 10th house energy, overall having a lot of 10th house energy, that's gonna be a huge focus on career for yourself. Um, what else you can look at? Yeah, mainly 10th house energy, I would say. Capricorn, like if you have Capricorn energy going on in there, what I will say is like, even with the 10th house, like it's usually gonna be in the second half of your life. And a lot of the time Capricorn placements go through a lot in the earlier part of their life. So they kind of get knocked down a lot, but they basically like always come out on the end. Like they're gonna be interested in being like, they're gonna be interested in being like motivational speakers and things like this. So that's what I would look for. Thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Thank you for my, thanks for the likes, you guys. And thank you for the follows. And yes, I'm just reading your questions. So my zodiac sign is, my sun sign is in Libra. That's my sun. My moon is in Scorpio and my rising is also in Libra. Let's see what else you guys are seeing in here. I'm just going back up. Do you think that as a Scorpio rising, sorry, you said Leo rising, Scorpio Venus, do you think you as a Scorpio, sorry, I keep saying Scorpio rising, it's so interesting. Maybe your lover is going to be a Scorpio rising. But anyways, Leo rising, Scorpio Venus, you will find love. Yes, you will. But the thing is, Scorpio Venus needs depth when it comes to relationships, okay? So just keep that in mind. So if someone comes around and they're like offering you something that's not deep, 
just like don't waste your time with that person because you're seeking depth. That, like, like that's the main thing to understand for Scorpio Venus. Let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. You said Mars and Aquarius is very confusing to you. Okay, interesting. I did my Mars series. Okay, I'm editing the videos now. Aquarius was the last one that I did. So that one's probably not gonna come out for a while, but it was really interesting when I was doing the video for Mars and Aquarius because it's like, okay, you guys can look at Mars as like, okay, what motivates you? How you handle conflict is gonna be your goals in life, but you can also look at it as your personal power. And you can also look at it as like you're part of your identity. Thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Oh my gosh, you guys are hyping me up today. Thank you. But yes, so that's what Mars is all about in your natal chart. Having it in Aquarius is a very interesting placement because the thing is like people say that Aquarius is aloof, but it's not that they're aloof. They're just ahead of their time. You know what I mean? And then it's interesting because I was explaining this to people earlier in the chat. When we look, this is going to be inception. Okay. I'm taking you guys into the crown. So I hope you guys can follow within the sign, right? Within the sign, there's always the heart of that sign, right? So preceding Aquarius, the quote unquote, like sign before that is going to be Capricorn. So within Aquarius energy, there is this energy, right? Of like wanting to work hard, right? And wanting to hustle and wanting to basically put your time into something that is for the greater good of all. That's Aquarius energy, right? It's all about for a higher purpose, connecting the collective together. And it's always like something to do with efficiency, right? Because it still is, it used to be ruled by Saturn. Yes. So it has that energy. And then at the same time, it's after Capricorn. So you carry that energy within you. Okay. So within the Mars and Aquarius, these are the things that are going, going to motivate you. Things that are futuristic ahead of the time. You know, you might be innovative. You might be into technology. You could be into astrology. You could be into just things, even fashion, like anything that's ahead of the time. So Aquarius energy is always mastering timing, right? That's what they're kind of struggling with because it's like Aquarius feels restricted down here because of the Saturn restriction. But what, but what restricts Aquarius is time, okay? Because if you look at Aquarius energy, right? From Scorpio onwards, they're all the spiritual signs. So all those signs, they're the spiritual, like the ones that don't really deal with like the physical plane. They don't really deal with the physical reality if you think about it, right? So Aquarius, right, is like, they come down here and like in the energy of Aquarius is like everything in the higher planes happens faster, it happens sooner, it happens like, you know, like almost instantaneously when you're in the higher vibrations. But down here, that's not what's happening. Down here, it's very Saturnian. So then Aquarius feels restricted by time. So it's almost like Aquarius energy is always kind of like trying to balance and master this like timing. You know, when am I going to pitch my idea? Should I pitch it now? Should I pitch it? You know, like that's kind of what happens. And sometimes what happens with Aquarius energy is they tend to basically like stop speaking, you know, they tend to kind of close off their throat chakra because they might feel like people don't understand them and they might feel like they are kind of talking to a wall. But the suggestion for that is like, you have to start where the collective is at. And that's what Aquarius hates, right? Because Aquarius doesn't want to talk about like mindless things. They want to talk about things that they think have meaning, right? which is things that are futuristic, right? All these things that I mentioned, philanthropy, how can we help the collective? You know, you probably see a lot of holes when you're growing up. So it's like for a lot of like these energies, I feel like the collective is catching up to you guys. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like they're getting there. So you might feel a little bit more like activated or like in alignment with your purpose, probably from when Pluto goes into Aquarius. Oh my gosh, hey Derica, how are you? Yay, I'm so glad that that resonates. So that's the overall like Aquarius energy, right? So when you have it in the Mars, this is your personal power, right? Like that's what motivates you. So it's like if someone comes to you and they're like, hey, you know, what do you think about, I don't even know, something that you might not think is interesting, whatever, plants, I don't know, let's say it's plants, <laughs> just as an example, nothing against plants, right? And you're gonna be like, yeah, okay, okay. But then you are gonna come through and you're gonna be like, okay, well, how can we help the plants grow, right? I actually discovered this app where it's like they can like scan the plant and tell you like what's going on with it. Do you need to water it more? Like all these types of things. So that is Aquarius energy. Like it's like adding meaning to things basically. What do you think about eating meat on the spiritual journey? Very interesting question. I know this question gets a lot of different opinions. I'll tell you guys mine. This is just my opinion. So I don't know, like this will resonates with me and I only do things that resonate with me and I have a reason for everything that I do. So I'll explain to you guys my perspective. Other people might have different perspectives. Again, you know, take what resonates, leave behind what does not. But the thing is like, okay, this is kind of how my meat not eating journey went, right? Like I'm a vegetarian. I also don't eat eggs. So basically it was really interesting because slowly I noticed I was weaning myself off of um, 
off of meat, right? I was, and this is just happening behind the scenes. Like I wasn't realize, like I didn't realize that this is what was happening. Like I just slowly stopped eating like certain things, right? And then basically what happened was I actually went out with my friends one night and then I had like a halal chicken like sandwich or whatever it was. And then in my head, I was like, oh my gosh, this tastes so good. And I just like kept thinking about it. I'm like, why does it taste so good, right? And I'm like, why does it taste different than like other like chicken sandwiches or whatever that I've had before, you know? And then I had the epiphany because like I think about things so much, I guess that's how I get my like ideas. So then I had the epiphany and I was like, oh my gosh, it tastes better because they bless the animal or whatever before they take the animal out. So that was kind of step one in the process, right? So I had that epiphany and I was like, okay, right? So this makes sense. And then as time went on, like I went traveling and I was like, let me just like try out vegetarianism. Like already I was only eating chicken at that point anyways. So slowly, it was like a slow journey for me. And then I noticed like, I noticed that as I stopped eating meat, like I'm very energetically sensitive and I pick up on energy. So for me, I just like came to the conclusion that I was picking up on a lot of the fear energy that the animals had, right? Like I was literally picking up on that. Like I was picking up on their energy. So that's why I stopped eating meat. Cause I was like, I'm literally picking up on this other being's energy, right? So that's kind of that whole journey. And then I noticed that as I gave up meat, so it was a process, right? So first, yeah, I gave up all the other ones like beef and pork, like I barely ate those already. And then it was just chicken and I still ate fish. And then I was like, not like as strict with it. So I would eat like, let's say like, you know, like if the meat touched it, right? Like if it was like a soup and it, like there was chicken inside, I wouldn't eat the chicken piece, but I would still eat like the soup, right? Cause it's like, it was so gradual, right? But then I started noticing that like, yeah, as time goes on, like, again, it's like all about yourself, right? And like being in tune with yourself and just like noticing like the differences. I just started noticing that like, I wasn't like picking up on anxiety anymore and just like darker energies and like lower energies. So yeah, it was like a process. And then eventually I gave up eggs. So I still eat dairy because I love ice cream. <laughs> I love ice cream, but I try to replace it as much as I can. Like I have almond milk and these types of things, but yeah, so I don't eat meat at all. And yeah, I guess everyone's journey is their own. It depends on you as a person. Maybe you're not as energetically sensitive. Maybe you don't pick up on energies like from like the animals and the beings but that was kind of like that whole process so and then what happened was after I basically stopped eating meat I noticed that I was becoming more psychic and I was becoming more intuitive because it makes sense you're not taking on this external energy that's like conflicting with your energetic field that's just how I saw it so that is that story let's see what else are you guys saying in here I'm just going back up. I will get to everyone's questions. You said you're a third house Libra moon. Okay, third house Libra moon. That, wow, that is a lot of energy. You're gonna be super intellectual, but you might struggle with people pleasing and just like, again, you know, like debating a lot. Like, should I do this? Should I do that? Let's see. Seventh house ruler is in the second house. You said your seventh house ruler is in the second house. Your seventh house cancer, so your moon is in the second. Very nice that so you said, what about Mars in the eighth house? Very interesting. Okay, I just did my series on uh, the Mars placements, although it's in the sign, it's not in the house, but it could be similar energetically. So Mars in the eighth house, okay. Mars in the eighth house, if you learn all about energy and how energy works and how you can harness energy, okay? you basically can manifest anything left, right, and center. That is Mars in the eighth house. So I don't know where I heard this, or maybe just like, I don't know, maybe I just thought of it in my head. I don't know if I ever saw a video about this, but there was like something where like, there was like an athlete and the athlete was basically saying that they, before like, I don't know if it was like boxing or something, like something like that, right? Before their matches that they don't sleep with anybody or even like they had a girlfriend. I can't remember like word for word what it was, but the overall idea and the premise was that, I don't know if their coach told them, it was something like this, where they were basically like, don't like sleep with anyone or don't sleep with your girlfriend before your match or before important matches. Cause basically what this person was doing was harnessing their own sexual energy, right? So the more that you harness it, you're able to manifest, right? So that's kind of Mars in the eighth house. Like Mars in the eighth house is going to understand that topic, okay? Let's see what else you guys saying in here. Seventh house in Taurus and, oh my gosh, thanks so much for the likes you guys. Seventh house in Taurus and you have Gemini stellium in it's Mars. Mercury, Venus, Saturn, and North Node. So ruler of the seventh house, ruler of the seventh house is in the seventh house. What does that mean? Okay, so ruler of the seventh house is in the seventh house. Very interesting. Maybe your partner is going to be someone that maybe you meet through your friends. It could be this. Maybe you and your partner start a business together with seventh house ruler in the seventh house. 
Maybe it's going to be someone that is like a lawyer or interior design or in the fashion world or like in the legal world overall. Like that's kind of what the seventh house ruler can tell you. It can tell you maybe what type of person this could be. It could also tell you maybe how you might meet this person. So you yourself with a seventh house ruler in the seventh house, you can meet your future partner through seventh house like things. Okay. So what is this through your friends? you know, social events, networking events, like groups of people, right? It could be through, again, like maybe it's a lawyer, you know, like these types of things. Maybe it is interior design. Maybe you're selling your house and then you have to stage your house and the person is a stager, like these types of things. Like it's the overall idea. I have a video on that if you want to learn even more. So definitely check out my YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure it's in my miscellaneous playlist, like the seven house ruler video. Let's see what else you guys say in here. Oh yes, so you also said you have seventh house in Taurus and then you have a Gemini stellium in it. So is your Gemini stellium in the seventh house? If you're still in the room, let me know. Any tips for your Saturn return in the 12th house? You have one year left. Oh my gosh, yes. Saturn return is intense. Honestly, all I can say for Saturn return is like the only way out is through. That's all that I can say. Because like there's, there's no way to mentally prepare for it. Like there literally isn't. And it's just like sometimes when you're going through your Saturn return, like... The thing is, I see Saturn return as you being put on your path, okay? So it's literally going to come through and clear out things that don't serve you. That's kind of pushing you into adulthood officially, okay? I made a video recently where I talked about how, like, adolescence should be basically extended until your Saturn return. So enjoy your time, okay? And it kind of puts you into adulthood. It puts you on your path. It puts you into your purpose alignment, right? So you might, you know, lose friends during this time. It depends, right? You said you have it in the 12th house. So you might have a lot of karmic things coming up during your Saturn return. You might have a lot of unconscious fears coming up that you're clearing during your Saturn return. Maybe you're going to revisit your spirituality during your Saturn return. Maybe you're going to develop different belief systems when it comes to spirituality during your Saturn return. So that is the overall idea with that Saturn return in the 12th house. Yes. Let's see. How long is Saturn return? You're having one right now. It's not so bad. Yeah, it's not bad. It depends. Like, it depends on you as a person. It depends what house you have it going through. Um, people, like, the thing is, unfortunately, like, people, like, I don't know, like, people put fear into everything. And that's what I mean. Like, the only way out is through. So people, I feel like, spend more time fearing their Saturn return rather than actually going through it. You know what I mean? Like, when I had my Saturn return, I was so resistant to it. I was like, I am not letting this get the best of me. And I feel like I kind of fought like against it. So don't do that. <laughs> Just kind of go with the flow of things. So yeah, let's see what else you guys think in here. Your video. Oh, it did it. Oh, that's so nice. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad that it did. Yes, you guys definitely check out my YouTube channel. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, tips for Saturn in the 12th house. I find that Saturn in the 12th house. Okay, anytime you guys have 12th house anywhere in your natal chart, this is just the way that I see it. I see it as you basically carrying over karma into this lifetime, okay? So sometimes it's karma with the father, the Saturn in the 12th. Sometimes it's karma with authority or authoritative figures. Sometimes it is karma with like your managers and your bosses. Like it depends how it manifests, but you can kind of look at it as like in this lifetime, you're closing out the cycle wherever you guys have the 12th house energy in, right? So for Saturn, you're closing out the Saturn cycle in this lifetime, okay? And I find that like, if we don't, this is just my opinion. Again, we don't have proof of this, right? But this is just how I've seen it psychically. It's like, if we don't close out that cycle, like it kind of continues. And I've noticed that people who have multiple 12 house placements, it's almost like they keep coming back to close out certain cycles and it's almost like it accumulates. Does that make sense? Let's see. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that. What house do you have it in? Let me just go back up. Let me know, Mary, what house you have your Saturn in. I'm curious. Okay, let's see, let's see, let's see. I'm just going back up. Aquarius, Sun, Capricorn, Moon, this is so you. Okay, that was from before. Thank you for that. Let's see. What should your brother do? Your brother has fifth house, um, part of fortune in Pisces, also in Pisces, North Node in Leo in the 10th house. Okay, he needs to do something creative and he needs to do something where he's being seen for sure, okay? So with the Piscean energy in there, maybe he's into music, your brother. But overall, North Node in Leo in the 10th house, that's like full-blown like dealing with the public, working with the public. So that can manifest a lot of ways. Maybe he's going to be into politics. It can manifest in that way. Maybe he's going to be like interested in being a public speaker or acting or theater, um, but something where he's in the public, okay? That's that 10th house energy where he's working with the public and like he is in it physically, okay? Because Leo needs to be physically seen. So he could be interested in these things. And then anything that's fifth house-like and 
Piscean like is gonna activate abundance for him. Okay, so Pisces is on a range. Okay, so spirituality, metaphysics, it can be film, it can be theater, it can be music, it can be art of any sort. Okay, that's Piscean energy videos, creating videos and these types of things. But I really like, I'm curious to know if he's into like, po like politics or something of that sort. Cause I can kind of see him shifting. Like I can see him doing that at first and then like switching it to something different. Let's see what else you guys think in here. Oh, you have it in the 12th house. Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, yeah, Saturn in the 12th house is definitely intense. Let's see what else you guys think in here. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh yes, you said yours is in the 12th house as well. I've noticed that tends to happen. That tends to happen in my in my lives in the chat. You guys like tend to kind of magnetize towards each other. Like there tends to be like a theme. Let's see. Do people with eighth house, do people with planets, wait, do people with planets your eighth house mean marriage or long-term potential or anything else? Do people with planets, are you saying in the eighth house mean marriage or long-term potential or anything else? That's actually a really good question. It depends what planets you have in there. I would have to think about that. Let's see. They're definitely going to be seeking things that are maybe like deep and a little bit more serious. Let's see, can you talk about your seventh house stellium? Yes, okay, so Salma, you have it in the seventh house. You have Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and North Node all in Gemini. Okay, so the seventh house energy is really interesting because I know you asked the question about the husband, so it makes sense because seventh house people, in this lifetime, you're mastering relationships, okay? So it could, it really makes sense like that you would be kind of looking for the one or seeking the one, like that's what seventh house is kind of here to master, right? You're here to master relationships and partnerships and these types of things, okay? So that's what seventh house is here to master. You're here to break through things like codependencies, fears of being alone, okay? Settling for people, because sometimes the seventh house really wants to be in a partnership or really like has this ideal dream of like the one, they can put it sometimes on the wrong person, so just something to keep in mind, okay? Having all that Gemini energy in there, you're gonna be highly intellectual, highly smart, even seventh house, like the seventh house people are gonna be very good at like business. Cause the thing is like the seventh house is good at like negotiating contracts and these types of things. You're gonna be diplomatic. So you could be interested in something like this, like international relations, especially with Gemini energy in there. So that could be something that you're interested in or just like PR, marketing, um, communication overall, written or spoken word is gonna be something that's interesting. But the main thing, could be the relationships. Because the thing is, seventh house people don't feel like they're complete unless they're in a unit. You know what I mean? Because sometimes when we look at people, right? Sometimes people are, there's different types of people in this world, right? Let's say some people are constantly looking for a partner of some sort, probably seventh house people, because they probably feel on a higher self level that, you know, this is subconscious, like without even realizing, right? Because of the energy, it's like, they might feel like when they're in a unit with this person or whoever that person is, they activate other things for themselves, right? So you have Venus in the seventh house, so these are partnerships, right? So that's kind of like the energy. So it would make sense, right? So for some people, like you'll notice, right? Cause you can even look at natal charts to see like what would activate after marriage for certain people and these types of things. What I will say for Saturn in the seventh house though, definitely wait until after your Saturn return to get married. Definitely wait because Saturn in the seventh house is mastering relationships over an extended period of time. I mean, obviously you have the free will to do whatever you want. Okay, so like that's my disclaimer right there. But you know, Saturn in the seventh house, because they're constantly seeking like serious relationships, and it's interesting because Saturn in the seventh house people, you know, when they're maybe in their early 20s, they could go through like Saturn, they go through like the Saturn in the fifth house transit and they can meet someone who is more mature, right? It could be older or more mature, and they could start dating this person and then, you know, maybe get married to them or whatever. But, you know, things could get rocky around the time you go into Saturn, you're into your Saturn return, which is Saturn in the seventh house. That's why sometimes Saturn in the seventh house people, I don't want to speak this into existence, but sometimes if they get married before their Saturn return, they could end up in a divorce because it goes out of the seventh and then it goes into the eighth. Okay. So that's the division of assets that is divorce and these types of things. I'm not trying to speak it into existence. That's just astrologically the way that they recommend it. So my suggestion for this energy is be aware that you like relationships. You want relationships always, you know, if you are like seeking marriage early or whatever it is, I mean, everyone has their own path at the end of the day. Like that's fine. Just again, maybe keep that at the back of your mind. That's something that could potentially take place. But overall, like that's what Saturn in the seventh house is mastering. Okay. They're mastering relationships and it's like, over an extended period of time. So Saturn in the seventh is always gonna be, you know, having friends from like young. Okay, that's Saturn in the seventh house. Like, you know, friends from like their childhood, right? Again, relationships that are over ex an extended period of time. Let's see what else you guys saying in here. With the, with, oh, the umbrella in the sky. Which one was that, Derica? With the umbrella in the sky. Oh, that was in my story, right? Yeah, they were really, really cool. 
I wish I got a better picture. It was just like a quick little selfie. Let's see what else are you guys seeing in here. Does Jupiter represent husband? Yours is in Libra in the eighth house, conjuncting your Venus in a Scorpio. It depends, okay? It always gets confusing. So, okay, hold on, let me think. It depends because it's like for, okay, for people, I'm gonna say it like this, okay? For people who are seeking a feminine energy leaning partner, you're gonna look at the moon and you're gonna look at the Venus, okay? For people who are seeking a masculine energy leaning partner, you're gonna look at the Mars and you will look at the, Jupiter, I believe. Okay. And then if you want to know overall about marriage and partnership, what you want to do is you want to look at your seventh house ruler. Okay. And see what house is that. And I have videos on all of that on my YouTube channel. You can also look at your Juno for marriage as well. But I actually heard somebody else say, and I liked what they said. They basically said that they feel like Juno is not strong enough because it's an asteroid to represent marriage. I have a video on that on my YouTube channel as well. So if you guys want to check it out, that's all under my miscellaneous playlist to see what's going on. But it made sense to me because it's like, it is just an asteroid. So how could it like represent marriage? But I mean, it's interesting to take into consideration. Okay. You also want to look at the eighth house overall to see what's going on in there as well. Let's see what else you guys seeing in here. Let's see. Venus is retrograde in your fourth house. Do you think if you get a hair transformation, you'll regret it? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, do whatever you're called to do. I'm not gonna like, the thing is like Venus retrograde. This is what I was saying to the people earlier as well. Like when Venus is retrograding, if you're gonna do something, like this is the way that I see it. If you're gonna do something that you've always done, like let's say like you're someone who gets Botox, for example, and you've always gone to the same doctor and you know what it's like, right? Then, you know, it'll be fine because you know what to expect. But if it's something that's completely new, I don't know, like if you're gonna go get a tattoo, I would wait until after like things like this, something that might be permanent like that. I will wait until Venus finishes retrograding. If it's something that's out of your control and you have something booked, I mean, it is what it is. If you dyed your hair before and you're like, you know, like an expert at doing that, maybe, I don't know, but Venus retrograde overall for like beauty things, I would just wait until after. Let's see. Aquarius, you don't get why you're a hopeless romantic. Is it your Scorpio moon? Absolutely, it's your Scorpio moon. Let me know what you have your Venus in as well. And also let me know about your houses because you said you have your Saturn in the 12th house, right? Can you let me know if you have like a stellium in your natal chart or something of that sort, maybe in the 12th house? Your seventh house ruler is in the eighth house of Scorpio conjuncting your son. How will you meet him? Okay, so your seventh house ruler is in the eighth house. So you can meet this person through eighth house like things, okay? So actually, interestingly enough, it could be like someone that was like maybe, I, don't, I mean, I don't wanna, again, you know, you guys do whatever you wanna do, but it could be something that was like a situationship. It could be that, okay? I'm not saying that's gonna be for everybody, but it could be something like that because the eighth house deals with sex, death, rebirth, joint finances, taxes, the occult. It could be a financial advisor, right? Maybe go to the bank and meet him at the bank. For example, maybe it's at like an astrology meetup. Boom, you meet him at the astrology meetup. It could be this, it's eight house like things. So when you guys look at your seventh house ruler and you see what house it's in, if you guys are trying to increase the likelihood of meeting your partner, do those types of activities, okay? So eighth house is on that huge range, right? Taxes, maybe it's gonna be when you do your accounting, like through the accountant, whatever, right? Maybe it's like a friend of a friend, these types of things, okay? What else could it be? Psychology, psychologist, um, not that it could be your psychologist, but maybe this person is in this type of work, right? Or maybe it's your psychology class, like these types of things, okay? So it's anything that's eighth house like. Let's see, you're welcome. Capricorn sun, Aries moon, Aquarius, Venus, Cancer rising man. Sorry, you say Cancer Mars man, run. like. Let me know if he is a cis het man. I'm curious. <laughs> Cancer Mars, honestly, okay. I'm, I mean, I'm joking a little bit, but also not. Like, Cancer Mars, man, like, it depends what energy he is going into. If he is suppressing his inner feminine energy and he's about masculinity, like, Cancer Mars is not gonna mesh well with like that suppression of energy, okay? This person needs to be more in tune with their feminine side and their feminine energy and he might be more feminine, okay? So it kind of depends like, again, where is this person on the scale of their relationship with their own internal feminine energy? I'm just gonna say that. But for the other energies, the Aquarius Venus might make him a little bit more detached. Also, Cancer Mars man could have mommy issues. I'm just gonna throw that out there. like. 
That could also be something that's taking place. Again, if he is cishet, right? So if he falls under the traditional role, right, of like masculine, and this is what masculine energy is, there could be like, you know, this happening behind the scenes. And then you have Capricorn, Sun, Aries, Moon. I kind of feel like a lot of empty promises from this person. I don't know. I don't know if that's something that's taking place, but that's just like what I feel into when I read that. Because Aries, Moon can be very like, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, you know? Venus and Aries. Oh, you have Venus and Aries in the 12th house. Oh, you have Venus in the 12th house. That's a lot of karmic lovers that you're clearing through in this lifetime. So it's like past life enemies coming through as lovers. It can also be friends coming through as friends. Sometimes it can come through as friends as well for the 12th house. But what I will say, you guys, is we go through secondary progressions. So sometimes that might affect you more in the earlier part of your life. Seventh house ruler is in the eighth house. Oh, yes, we did you already. You said you also have Leo Midheaven at 29 degrees. We had somebody else in here with a Leo Midheaven at 29 degrees. Ruler is in the sun in the sixth house. Your reputation and career. Empty promises. Yeah, that's literally what I like. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, density in this person. Like when I, as soon as, because sometimes like when you guys tell me things about like your placements, I can hook into the energy. And that's just like what it feels like with this person. Like it feels like a lot of empty, pro like empty promises. It feels like a lot of like, I don't know, just like, I feel it in my solar plexus. So this person is more like dragged down, like in like maybe their lower nature and like, yeah, that's kind of just like what it feels like when I tap into that energy. So I don't know, up to you if you want to bother with that. That Cancer Mars, it's not for the faint of heart, I'll tell you that much. It can be very explosive, right? Because it's like, it deals with emotions, right? And it's all about the nurturing and like Mars is like, ma Mars on its own is a masculine energy and Mars wants to go. So this person can also sometimes fall into being lethargic. Like they can have a lot of like ambitions and goals, but they might not actually put them into action. So like, yeah, I wouldn't fall for this person's like potential. You know what I mean? Like maybe this person ha is like a, I want to do this, like cloud talker type of person, you know? Let's see what else you guys saying in here. You said you're gonna go hang out and create you guys and bangs. Oh my gosh, don't kill me. <laughs> oh my gosh, funny story. Actually, I went to Salem a few years ago and my friends wanted to meditate. It was Halloween and my friends wanted to meditate in the graveyard. And I was like, absolutely the F not. Like I am not going down that road. Thankfully, it didn't end up aligning because literally the whole city shuts down at like 12 a.m. By the way, like this is Salem, Massachusetts. I don't know if that changed since then, but yeah. <laughs> You said, wow, he's hard to deal with, honestly. Yeah, honestly, I don't know how deep you're into the situation, but if it's fresh, I would just look for another one. Just replace. Next. Let's see. Sammy says, because that dynamic, I don't know about your natal chart, but it can turn into like you like mothering this person like very quickly. And we don't want that. No, 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 no. Sammy says, North Node, seventh house, Sag, Jupiter in the fourth house of Virgo. North Node, seventh house Sagittarius, and your Jupiter is in Virgo. It is in the fourth house. I like Jupiter in Virgo. Jupiter in Virgo is very nice for like focusing on things, working hard, attention to detail, like these types of things. Like it's gonna be very good for that. Healing, being in the healing world. You might be interested in spirituality overall. Part of your life purpose, okay. So this is gonna resonate for the other individual if you're still in the chat that had a lot of seventh house energy. So for seventh house people, okay, and you have your north node in the seventh house, they get propped up by the people around them, okay? So that's seventh house north node, okay? You're getting propped up by the people around you. So relationships are going to be very important. And it's interesting because your south node would be in Gemini and it would be in the first house. So your past life could have been very like solo or you doing your own thing or maybe just like picking yourself. But in this lifetime, you're meant to kind of like, you know, learn about relationships, not just like romantic, it's all relationships, right? Like the people around you are propping you up, you know, into your purpose. That's really what that is, okay? So relationships are going to be very, very important for you. Jupiter in the fourth house is going to be conjuncting your IC. I'm curious to know if your IC is in Virgo also. Let me know. Oh my gosh, you weren't here. Did I talk about, okay, let me just go back up. What were you saying? Okay, you said Leo, midheaven, 29 degrees, and ruler in the... Okay, ruler is the six ruler is the sun in the sixth house. Okay, that I would have to look into actually like physically to see what's going on. But Leo Midheaven at the 29th degree. Okay, let me think about this. You said yes, it is. Yay. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that, that resonated. Okay, Leo Midheaven, 29 degrees. I had someone in the chat earlier with a Leo Midheaven at 29 degrees as well. You know, it's fascinating to see every time I see this every time. There's always like groups like that, like come together when I'm doing the chats that have similar placements. So 29 degrees, you basically don't get out of that sign until you master that sign, okay? So when you have your midheaven, right? It was your midheaven, let me just go back up, okay? It says the 29th degree of Leo, you basically have to master, right? The Leo energy within, confidence, being out there. I feel like a lot of your purpose is breaking through, um, like, 
you know, because you have a lot of seventh house energy in your chart. So it's kind of breaking through like codependencies and like fears of being alone and like really stepping into your full power, right? Because if we look at Leo, Leo's here to shine, you know, and it's like then when you're shining, you'll attract the people who are meant for you when you're at that point, right? But up until that point, there could be a lot of distractions. It kind of feels like actually with all that seven house energy in there pulling you, right? Because Leo, right, is here to shine, right? Here, to, especially in the midheaven, you need to be creative. I'm curious to know, are you a Scorpio rising? What's your rising sign in? Anyways, so yeah, Leo's here to shine, you know, especially in the midheaven. Your career needs to be something creative. You're shining, something like you're talking and you're being your full blown self, right? But with all the seven house energy, it kind of feel like it's pulling you, right? To focus more so on relationships and partnerships, which are a huge part, right? It's a huge part of it, but you don't want to get lost in that if that makes sense, right? Where it's like deterring you from your life purpose. So you're always going to notice, right? Like, I don't know, that's just how the earth plane works. It's like, you might notice yourself like, okay, oh my gosh, I'm so in my element, boom, distraction tries to pull me off. So you always have to like pull yourself, right? And be like, okay, is this a distraction or is this something that's legit? That might be something that takes place. You said Scorpio. Oh my gosh, yeah, Scorpio rising. Yes, 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 Scorpio rising goes through a lot. I have a Scorpio rising video on my YouTube channel. It's called Barbara Talks. Yes, Scorpio rising is, I call them expect the unexpected. Sometimes people can be interested in acting as well because of like the eyes, you know, they're going to be very good at like portraying on themselves. Let's see what else are you guys saying in here. You said your ex Scorpio Venus is right above your Scorpio moon, same degree. Is this why it's hard to let go? Yes. Did you have, can you tell me what your Pluto is in as well, Mary, if you're in the room still? Yeah, so Scorpio Venus is interesting. I did a video on all of the moon conjunctions. So having moon conjunct Venus, it's like, it's very indulgent. You said that's so true. Yeah, that's just what it feels like when I tap into it. It feels very much like, I don't know if this is like something to do with like, again, it could be very like societal also because there's a certain structure in society, right? That prioritizes certain things. If we look at it, I mean, like we're kind of slowly breaking that down. But it's like, I feel like you kind of might have this push pull between I want to do this and I want to express myself this way. But like the whole maybe people pleasing thing, pulling you back, um, like all of that seven house type of stuff, maybe like pulling you in a different direction. You said Sagittarius and he's a Sagittarius. Okay, well, at least it's not conjuncting your Pluto. So Venus, okay, so the whole reason why like Venus conjunct moon is like hard to like, I guess let go is like sometimes this partnership feels like a friendship, right? It feels very, it's one of the positive aspects in this industry actually, moon conjunct Venus, okay? So that could be the reason why it's like, it could have been smooth, you guys could have enjoyed a lot, you could have like indulged a lot together. It could be these types of things, you know? Like maybe when you guys were together, you activated a lot of like abundance and like, joy right because it's venusian right anytime something's venusian is like you're enjoying right you're indulging you are maybe enjoying the finer things in life okay so that could be part of the reason you said you have a pluto sign and same pluto sign and degree that's just the overall generation like the whole generation has a specific karma to play on their own so pluto and sag what i like about them is they're very entrepreneurial at heart so a lot of them are like 20 and they're already starting their own businesses because that's Sagittarius energy. Sagittarius energy is entrepreneurial, okay? So that's Sagittarius. Also, they're all about like the higher mind, the learning, the open energy, the higher philosophies, learning all about these things. So that's Pluto and Sag, amongst many other things. I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel while on Pluto and Sag, on all the Pluto, I have a Pluto playlist. So it's all the generational planets. You guys can check it out there. Okay, so... Ray Rod said you have a stellium in five planets in Scorpio and on the eighth house shadow work is your life, but also power. Yes. So the thing is, okay, so what I'm going to say about Scorpio energy, Scorpio is basically meant to learn to alchemize. Okay. They're here to learn to turn dust into gold. Okay. And it's when you have it in the eighth house, it's on the money access. Okay. So I'm curious to know if you're still in the room, can you tell me what your, what day are you born on and what your life path number is? I'm really curious to know if it's like eight by any chance. Anyway, so that's the thing, okay? That's the eighth house. You're on that money access, okay? But the thing is, Scorpio deals with other people's money. So it's like there could be themes here of like debts, right? Or wanting loans or, you know, like learning to manifest money. Like you're really mastering that when you have the eighth house. Stellium. And then on top of that, it's in Scorpio. You said you were born on November 9th. Can you tell me what everything adds to your day, your month and your year and what the life path number is? If you were to assign different, okay, this is really interesting that you asked that because I've been thinking about this. If you were to assign a sign to different generations, what would they be? So all the generations already have a sign. Okay, so Gen Z is Pluto and Sag, right? But what I've been thinking about lately, like I've noticed a lot of Western tropical astrologers sometimes move into Vedic. And I've really been kind of playing with the idea to see 
if Pluto and Sagittarius energy takes on, if like Gen Z takes on more Pluto and Scorpio energy, like that's something that I've been kind of thinking about. So I don't have an answer yet, but it's interesting that you asked that. Oh my gosh, thank you. I get that a lot, Lana Del Rey. Yay. I know you guys love her. Let's see, what else are you guys saying in here? 10th house, Saturn in Capricorn. You feel like it's a difficult one. Also, North Node is also in Capricorn. Oh wow, yeah, that's definitely challenging. Is your midheaven also in Capricorn? If you're still in the room, Shay Shay, can you tell me? Life path nine. Oh my gosh, so you're double nine, nine, nine. Let's see, you're probably closing out some sort of cycle in this lifetime. Okay, so the 10th house Saturn is one of the wealth placements actually. So, but that's in the second half of your life. That's the struggle with Capricorn energy. It was so funny. I had a one, <laughs> sorry, I'm like dying already. I had one friend who um, was dating someone who had a bunch of Capricorn energy and like they wanted me to look at the natal chart. And I was just like, honestly, it's up to you. Like if you want to stick around, like this person's going to be wealthy like later on in life. I don't know how much time you got to waste. So that's kind of like Capricorn energy, okay? This is the second half of life, okay? That this person kind of starts to acquire money and wealth. So same thing for you. That's in traditional astrology, okay? The frequency of the planet's higher. So I like to be hopeful, right? And think that maybe because the frequency of the planet's higher, these things can happen sooner, okay? But you're mastering that. You're mastering money, finances, wealth, elevating the financial status. Your midheaven is also in Capricorn. Yeah, it's a lot of Capricorn energy. A lot of the time, Capricorn people go through a lot in the earlier part of their life. Like they go through a lot and sometimes they age backwards. So sometimes when they're younger, they might take on a lot of responsibility. So they could take on a lot of like working. Maybe they start working at an early age. Maybe the parent household is like a business and you start working like, you know, at age 10 or whatever it is. Like it's things like this, okay, with Capricorn energy. So it's a struggle because it's like, you know, at some point, right, you kind of have to live that aspect of yourself that didn't get to live, if that makes sense. So sometimes later on in life, Capricorn energy can struggle because it's like, you know, especially if they go more into like that inner child energy and they're healing that inner child, they might not want responsibility then because a lot of responsibility that was, was placed upon them. So that's kind of like the struggle with Capricorn energy. It's like, I feel like what holds Capricorn people back is having a lot of responsibility placed upon you at a young age. And then when you grow up, right? When adulthood is all about having responsibility, right? Well, then you don't want it, you know? So that's the struggle because to have anything or to have success, you have to take on a certain amount of responsibility. So that's kind of like the struggle with Capricorn energy. So that's why I think over time, they kind of learn these things and then they age backwards, right? So when they come into some form of stability in their life that they're seeking, they kind of go more into like the inner child. What's my favorite energy out of all the signs? I don't know. That's a good question. I like all of the signs like for their own reasons. Um, and then I have like signs that like I vibe with the most based off of like my own energy. I don't know. I honestly, it's really hard to say. I think like as I've like learned about astrology, I've learned to like appreciate all of the signs for like their own things. Cause it's like, you see the positive and the negative and, and the negative like aspect of all the signs. So it's really, really hard to say. I like all of them. I don't know. Let's see if the question is, who do I get along with best? That's the answer would be different. So let me know. <laughs> Let's see. What else are you guys saying in here? Nine life path number. Yeah, numerology is really cool. You guys can learn more about numerology by like Googling about it and seeing like what the life path number means and what the day number means because both of them have like their own meaning. Which one do I get along with best? Okay, so for me, it's really interesting. Okay, I get along with Gemini energy. I get along with Aquarius energy. It depends again for like what, you know, it depends for what purpose, like, what are we trying to achieve, right? Is it a friendship? Is it a romantic partnership? Is it um, a business partnership? So yeah, I like Capricorn energy a lot. Um, I get along with Capricorns a lot. Who else? Let me think. Taurus, I get along with Taurus. Actually, Leos, I get along with Leos as well. Depends though. Sometimes, because I have a lot of Scorpio energy in my chart. So sometimes the Leo energy can go in a different direction where it's like, it can be squaring. But overall, I get along with Leos really, really well. And who else? That's pretty much it, I would say. Your sun, moon, your sun, moon, and rising is Taurus. Do you have it all in the 12th house or is it all in the first first house? Let me know. You use two different sign websites for your chart and one says you're in Aries rising and the other one said you were. Let me know what the other one says. Taurus rising, do I recommend? Oh, you have it all in the first house. Wow, okay, so Shay, I feel like you're really, really here to start some sort of new cycle for the whole family and for yourself on a soul path on a, like a soul level and it's like a lifetime about really figuring out who you truly truly are and what you're meant to do here let me see so i'm curious to know one of them says you're an aries rising is it the degrees 
I actually had that happen once when I was looking at someone's reading, when, when I was doing someone's reading and looking at someone's chart, there was two different websites that I always use because I always use two sites for everybody to look at their charts and they showed two different moons, moon signs. So my recommendation for that is see the degrees and see which one resonates. Yeah, last degree of Aries, you're probably gonna resonate more with Taurus anyways because we go through secondary progressions in our natal charts so it's like even if you were in aries rising you would have probably progressed into taurus by now like you might resonate more with taurus i don't know there's different websites you can go on astro seek i like astro seek the best but the whole reason that i like astro seek is because it's like laid out very nicely <laughs> that's my inner virgo like i like the way that it's like laid out like it's very much like nice and organized you know um that one's nice I like astro.com is really good. Okay, that one's good for like everything. Like I would say that's probably like number one. Um, and then another one that's like quick to look at could be like Cafe Astrology. Like I'll put that in like third place, but all of those websites are good. Let's see. Any insights on Mars and Sagittarius in the ninth house? Mars and Sagittarius. Yeah. So the thing is Sagittarius energy struggles to basically pick what it is that they want to do okay that's the struggle with Sagittarius energy like they're going to be scattered especially when you have it in the Mars it's like you have so much personal power but sometimes it gets spread out right or like you want to do this and you want to do that and you want to do all these types of things okay so my suggestion for Mars, Mars and Air, Mars and Sag is to pick that thing that they want to do right and focus on that because the fire energy boom like you're gonna just like go after all the things right like you're going to be very good at it this the fire energy is going to like put this you know passion into purpose kind of thing right and then you have it in the ninth house so things that are going to motivate you are anything to do with spirituality higher mind higher learning maybe sports and athletics for sagittarius in there um education overall philosophies like all these types of things are going to be like very very like interesting to you right this is what motivates you are you still an aries rising I mean, this is okay. This is how I see it. This is how I see it, you guys, in terms of progressions. It's an overlay on top of the energy that you guys already have. Okay. So if you started out as an Aries rising, you're an Aries rising. Yes. And then on top of that, it progresses into Taurus rising. So you can kind of look at it that way. What I would say, Mary, is okay. There's a few things. Do the houses change? Like, did the houses change when you changed um, all of, like, when the two websites gave you the different information? Did they change? And then I would have to say, like, look and see what resonates most with you, okay? And, you know, what, like, in terms of the charts and the houses, like, what is resonating more with you? And same with, like, the rising sign. And the best way to know this is to see the rising, see the descendant, which is your seventh house, see the midheaven, and then see the uh, I see as well. That's going to tell you a lot, right? But there's a huge potential that you're carrying. Yeah, it threw you off. Yeah, I'm curious to know also, like, are both websites showing you the same type of system? Are you looking at, like, you know, is one of them showing you a different type of system? Like, that's the only other thing I can think of. Okay, Shay, for your question, to help people find their birth time. I don't do that. There's something called, I think it's redaction. I'm not sure. But there, there are people out there who are able to guess the birth time if I know you as a person and I know your story and I think about it long enough, I guess, cause I'm clear cognizant, I could like think and see what fits. Do you know what I mean? But I don't do that professionally. Like I could maybe do that for my friends or whatever when I'm like really, really thinking about it. But I would always still recommend to go to someone who actually like, um, basically like, what's the word? Like is professional in that particular area of astrology, right? Specializes, that's the word that, you know, they know how to find that specific time because they're going to ask you about specific life events, okay? They're going to ask you if you know approximately the window of when you got, and of when you were born. And then the thing is like, it all changes every 10 minutes, you know? So it's really hard to guess the houses, but yeah, there's definitely people out there that could definitely assist you with that. So yeah, you're welcome. All right, you guys, I'm going to sign off. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Make sure you check out my YouTube channel. It's called Barbara Talks, and I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your evening.